Congratulations. I'm proud of you. I heard you did well today. You kept your mouth shut despite all the temptations to speak. Stayed silent when questions were asked. Even better, you did not share a word despite the flood of interesting information that came your way. You told no one and remained safe for now. I hope I was not misinformed. Of course, it was early. You were alone at breakfast and your phone was set to silent. But now, your body enriched with broken bread, rich coffee aromas caressing your nostrils. You become emboldened. You pick up the phone. It reacts to your touch and becomes alive, vibrating in your hand. It feels good. Colors, movement on screen, beeps and pings. The world is live in your hand. Do you remember I told you almost everything is not worth saying? Don't get that. It's not yet 9 a.m. Anyone calling now certainly wants something before anyone else. Let them wait. Sometimes people call early to underline that what they want is most important and time-dependent. If you answer, you might say no. Hmm? Unfortunately, experience has taught you that no is just a conditional yes. You leave the apartment, walk briskly to the elevator, thinking the corridor smells like a hotel, keys and phone in hand. You press the button, but it's too late. The neighbor opens his door, keen to speak. Going down, he asks. No, Herman, you want to say I'm going to the 13th floor to jump. But you say nothing, just nod. He gets in and you descend. Amy must be due back any day now, said the voice next to you. Where was it again, Mauritius? You turn. It's Bob, not Herman. You made a mistake. You're home in London, not Amy's mum's place in Cincinnati. That's right. You left the flat, walked slowly to the lift, thinking the hallway smells like a hotel. You're losing it. The sliding doors open. There's only five floors. Bob's on his way out, not Herman. No need to say anything. The last time you had this conversation, you told the neighbor you'd be away for two weeks. And that's when the apartment was ransacked. Was there a connection? Did sneaky Herman arrange for the thieves to come in Cincinnati? He looked the type. If you'd said nothing, you'd still have your clothes and Amy would have her camera on. And what kind of thieves steal clothes anyway? And if you'd said nothing about leaving the apartment unprotected, you might now know, but you never will. An example of silence producing answers. That morning you took the London Underground Tube to work. The carriage was packed, passengers talking over the jolting seats. You heard a woman assuring an older man she had a gardener who did some maintenance work. Uh, he knows a builder. So confident was she. The older man nodded. A piece of paper with some numbers changed hands. In effect, she had just underwritten the character and quality of a stream of people on the basis of, what, pretty flowers in her garden? When things go wrong, she will own all the harm that follows. Much harm did, as often does, with strangers on a train. But your attention was taken by a fat Ukrainian shouting into his phone. He wore earbuds, the volume high, trying to conquer the noise on the train. He stared at his phone defiantly, his end of the conversation in roars. If he knew others were being blasted, he cared not. At each jolt of the train, his weight squeezed a passenger to his side. The woman next to him looked at you and raised eyebrows. Poor thing, you thought. She seemed to appreciate your sympathy. 
so much expressed under the deafening noise. The big meeting at work had begun in the classroom by the time you had stepped away from the refreshment kitchenette. That's the bench with espresso machines and electric urns. It had been relocated to an open passage so workers could not hide there indefinitely. So, armed with a large mug, you turned to see the usual windbags were windmilling and performing behind the glass. You allowed yourself to be seen. Your boss, in pain, signalled, signalled you to join them. You mimed a phone call with thumb and pinky to your ear, tilted your head apologetically, then wisely tapped your watch, which meant the important call was due. You had almost reached the sanctuary of your office, but were intercepted by a power couple. They strode towards you, clearly needing someone for something. Yo, Tom, one of them called. This is your thing, isn't it? Not a question, an accusation. What the hell's the Lawson criterion? The company you work for does technical publications, scientific trade papers. You'd once told people you had an interest in atomic fusion as a power source, thinking no one would ever ask since fusion power has been, what, just ten years away for the last thirty years. Isn't that some kind of crossover point? That was power person number two, and she insisted, answering for you. Time for the oversized coffee mug to do its thing. Before you could do more than nod and swallow a gulpful, they saw you'd started taking milk in your coffee. Now, the staining power of milky coffee upon the shiny fabrics of power people, well, on their clothing cannot easily be measured. You swirled the mug, smiled, began to gesture, and they were gone, backing away to safety. You had learned early that it is a mistake to admit to any area of expertise, no matter how obscure. Despite that, you still have a weakness for revealing a scoop, speaking of some inside information, thinking that it will impress, or... In the most misguided moments, you think that someone has a right to know. That some force, or competitor, or plotter is working against them. When you'd confided to your boss, a nice guy really, that his previous business partner was joining a rival company, that was the day from when you were never quite trusted again. How had you found out, he wanted to know, uh, what do you mean you were at a wedding? How deep does this go? Those little after-work one-on-ones had stopped. The only invitations you get are free-for-alls. Sad, really. You'd only wanted to help. If you ever find yourself passing on intelligence because you only wanted to help, take a break. Lying to others is one sin. Lying to yourself is much graver. You had lunch at Gorolo's, a low-cost Italian eatery with small tables but loads of counters. Busy as ever, one of those places too packed to see who's eating in a group or eating alone. The last time you had actually spoken with anyone here, the place was almost empty at night. A late call from a close friend of your brother, over a couple of whiskies, young Norton had confided that his new wife had been cheating with a lowlife. Norton wanted you to have the man beaten to death, oh, well, close to it. Why come to me, you'd asked. Well, he'd heard you'd had friends in low places. Now, that was true, but you were surprised that people were passing that on. The guy's scum, a huge bastard, older than me, your brother's chum told you. So, you were maybe flattered that you'd been approached, though it was, well, it was really an insult. Norton was actually saying, to deal with trash, go to the trash man. If you had become involved, it would have gone badly. 
In affairs of the heart, everything is talked over with everyone. People forgive, form new alliances, and have powerful regrets. Any advice you might give would one day be held against you. Advice surely is a dish best eaten privately from a paper bag and thrown away. You could have only yourself to blame. If you did have friends in low places, the moment you spoke of them, even with family, especially with family, the more quickly the words travel. Whatever tiny asset those dangerous friends were, they had no value the moment people knew. You managed to avoid dealing with more office people that afternoon by closing your door, dimming the light, and rolling out two feet of complex flowcharts extending from the gap under your door. Anyone seeing this would think, better him than me, and move on. A heavy rain had eased by the time you left Covent Garden for Charing Cross. As you passed Hotel Z, a large black Daimler cut waves through the flooded road to ease in front of you. Beside the path of the swirling water, the rear door opened, lowering the darkened windows. A small man popped up, the balding, polished and tanned head of Cassius Rembrandt, the dubious forex trader to whom you'd directed exaggeration upon plain lie as to your experience and abilities six months ago. You'd not heard since. Tom, he smiled, waving, before a misstep tripped two feet of Cassius's four and a half feet, trousered deep into a misplaced drain. You couldn't help laughing. He snapped, Christ, this is wet. Indeed, water has that characteristic, you went to say, but held back. Though, what would anything matter now? This little angel and Vesta would surely have checked just some of those fibs, and probably only stopped to give you a rake. <laughs> Four times you had picked up the phone to pull back from your whoppers, to create plausible backstories, to get out of it, to at least fire blanket your reputation. But no, you never called. Tom, didn't you get my message? Cassius hoisted himself back to the foot panel of the limo, shaking a dripping leg. It's all on. Can you get away, May 5th? Sure you can. I gotta go. Late. The thing will call you, he ended, referring to his personal assistant. Window down, car moving, he added. You probably thought I was all talk. By not calling with a modified claim, by not babbling a retreat or creating some improbable story, you had been accepted. It was far from courage, but if you lay down a history, stick to it and say no more, because every word invites closer inspection. The armour of deceit does not gain strength by layers of silk. Amy, the love of your life, did not return home until the middle of the night. She landed at distant Stansted Airport. Don't come all this way to meet me, really, Amy had said in a voice message. You'd left the bedroom door open to hear the key turning, but it barely disturbed your sleep until the crumple of baggage dumped on the hallway rug told you she was back. Half awake, you saw her silhouette against the door as she checked you were under the cover. Amy showered at length in the guest bathroom. Consider it, as always. Should you tell her of the uptick to your career made on a wet London street? No, but that's more your superstitions than wisdom. If I tell, it might fold. In time, perhaps. Close as you are, you have learned not to report all you know. Amy's mad brother, for example. You like the guy. He values your opinion. He told you of his modern art scam, his postage stamp forgeries, the Iraqi antiquities adventure that was plain risky. Should you have kept quiet? Well, you didn't, and so you looked like an accomplice. You just encourage him, don't you? 
Amy complained. And why didn't you tell me straight away? Sometimes simply not speaking is evidence of guilt if you know damn well the mad brother will spill all to his sister as soon as he crumbles, and he always does. Sad as it is, when you can't win with an amusing loser, it is to him that you should not speak from the outset. Amy is personal assistant to a showrunner for a reality TV series set in exotic locations. Her boss, the mercurial Xander Colt, doesn't like wives and partners on location. He says he wants to keep everyone focused. Amy gives you the gossip as she returns from her shower wearing a T-shirt. You've only just opened your eyes, propped on your elbows. The celebs pretend to be ordinary people, Amy explains. The ordinary people want to be celebs. She sounds excited, but is just overtired. Before she can go on, you lift your palm to her cheek, and she falls silent, drawing yourself up to the first kiss. Then, as long familiar people do at the best of times, wrap into sleepy, wordless lovemaking. Now, since you and new friends can't hear us, it has come to my private attention that Amy's loathsome boss, Xander, whose appearance apes Russell Brand, has dark designs on Amy. So be it. His means, his device, according to his dealer, will be, as it has in the past, a triple dose of Oblivicum Sulfate 150, should I tell him. Should I wake Tom from his slumber to report an act that has not yet occurred? Of course not. What would he do? What could she do? No one shall profit from that intelligence. It's simply not worth saying. Of course, I, and that means you, now own what we know. Where that leads is another matter of responsibility, adopted or discarded. My lips are sealed. Rays of dawn's light sweeps across the bedroom. Amy opens her eyes to find Tom awake. She smiles and asks, What are you thinking? Nothing. And that should be the last word for today. Don't you think? Some viewers new to the channel might not know that I've written an autobiography. Unforgiving Destiny. There's a link in the description below, of course. It's a little writing underneath. Yeah. It follows the 37-year pursuit by authorities on five continents to imprison and twice push me toward death row. Also recorded as an audio book, it follows my career as an independent smuggler in the high life, New York to Columbia, Kabul to Copenhagen. I write and speak of the obsessed DEA agent who appears at every major arrest, my narrow miss of the death penalty in Thailand by escaping a Bangkok prison, times in the dungeons of Karachi, and later seeking a kidnapped friend after crossing the Afghan border. So, yes, the story keeps moving. You can laugh at me as I stumble through every trap and rebuild a fresh identity and life only to have the new life crushed. I suppose I've narrated a travel guide for underground tourists with a death wish. And if you ever suffer from such wishes, better to have someone else at the border checkpoint who becomes the target. That'll be me. Unforgiving Destiny comes with maps, diagrams, and a useful index of characters. Best plan is Get the audiobook and buy the ebook so you can tag all the scallywags. It'll cost you a fiver extra, but that will come my way. Huh? I mean, you're safe at home, and I'm the one standing in front of Boris the border guard with a stuffed suitcase and an iffy passport. Uh, that's only fair, don't you think? <laughs>